Welcome again. The lights are still off, and that's okay because we've got some presentation stuff that we're going to show you. So we're going to be very interactive this morning, a little bit different than what we are generally accustomed to. Uh, typically, we come here on Sundays, and I'm preaching out of a book of the Bible. This Sunday will be just a little bit different. If you were here last night, not actually here, but if you were with us, some of us last night, we were at the Heritage Hall, and we had a gentleman by the name of Nate Loper. He is from Canyon Ministries, and he was with us and gave an excellent uh, presentation. I don't know how he did that in one hour. Uh, my brain was just kind of shaking at, at many points during what he was saying. Um, so we, we, we decided let's, let's bring him here on Sunday, and we asked some of you guys to a ask some questions uh, for the expert. You can ask him anything you wanted to, and he is an expert on all things. I'm making this up as I go, okay? And so he's here with us this morning, and we are going to welcome Nate Loper. So you guys make him feel welcome this morning. Nate, come on out. We're going to sit down. Uh, we had stools, but that didn't work out. <coughs> Robin, uh, didn't, somebody didn't bring them. And um, so we've got a lot to do, and I'm going to get right into it. First, Nate, do you have any opening remarks that you would like to give? Um, so informal here. Yeah, no, this is no fantastic. I love this. I should have worn my like river outfit and like shorts and flip flops and a t-shirt because that's my normal, you know, uh, thing that I'm typically wearing. Um, what's that? That's right. And so it's fantastic to be here with you guys. Um, this is awesome. I met uh, Dan and Carrie about, what, 2018, I think it was? Yeah. They came on a tour with me at the Grand Canyon. So with Canyon Ministries, we provide Christian tours of the Grand Canyon on a daily basis, every day except for Sundays. We're out there doing tours. And we've been there for 27 years now doing creation-based tours in the Grand Canyon. Uh, not just tours along the rim, but also backpacking trips down in and across the Grand Canyon, as well as things like like multi-day river trips through the Grand Canyon. So that's pretty exciting. How many of you guys have ever rafted the Grand Canyon? We need a lot more of you to come down with us. Um, so it's fantastic stuff, but it's awesome. We got a chance to connect, and I feel like we've been friends ever since because I'm following them on Facebook, and they're seeing things, and so it's just really neat. It's fantastic to see what God has done with Refuge Church here and just amazing things that it's spectacular. So I love being here. This is actually the first time I've been to Cedar City, believe it or not. Nice. I have lived in the Four Corners my whole life and traveled a lot of places around Utah. Never have made it over to here. And I'm like, my family, we're coming back because this is awesome. That's awesome. So it's great to be here. Now, I have never in my entire life of going to church. All right. It's, I mean, I was almost born on the altar. All right. So I've been in church for 41 years. That's not a lie. Um, never have I heard from a pulpit the topic Dinosaurs. <laughs> so today is the day we're going to, this is not the only thing we're talking about, by the way. No. So the question is, Nate, we talked about this a little bit. Shout out to Jameson for bringing this question out last night. Were dinosaurs living in the time of Adam and Eve, and were dinosaurs on the ark, or did they just miss out on the boat altogether? Fantastic question. So uh, one of the great things about doing this today is this is a very different talk for me, too. But you guys had some fantastic questions to be able to ask and answer. And so, um, so looking into dinosaurs, we actually have a cool slide here with some dinosaurs you might like. So I'm glad all the kids are here today, because who doesn't love dinosaurs, right? So yeah, dinosaurs in the Bible, absolutely, we do believe that dinosaurs were created alongside with man on day six of creation. You know, the Bible tells us, you can see up here, um, it talks about them, that they were living, we believe, during Adam and Eve. And there's a verse right here in Genesis we can show you here. And it says, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. Now, this is day six of creation, right, Matthew? So we're talking about God not only creating all the land animals, but also creating man. And so on that sixth day of creation, we believe that those land animals, including dinosaurs, because dinosaurs are land-based animals, dinosaurs were created alongside with mankind. And so, yeah, we do believe that they were created, they were formed, you might say, on the same day of creation. Uh, with Candy Ministries, we believe that, you know, those days are real, true, actual days, and that God really did create all things within those six days and rested on the seventh. And then, of course, we also believe that there was a global flood, okay? Genesis 6, 7, and 8 describes the ark in Noah's day. It also describes the flood. And so the big question, of course, is what happened to those dinosaurs? And you can see here, well, a lot of those dinosaurs 
were wiped out during the flood, just like the rest of the life along the planet. I mean, everything that wasn't in that ark that had the breath of air in its lungs and walked upon the land was wiped out during the flood. And I think that's where we get a lot of our fossil record from. It's really the record, the remnant, a massive watery graveyard from that catastrophe. So the question, of course, comes in, right? Well, what about those dinosaurs? What happened to them? Well, again, most of them are wiped out by the flood. But I do believe that we had a few that were left behind after the flood, some that were on board the ark. So wait a minute. You're saying there were dinosaurs on the ark? Yeah, absolutely. It was a smelly situation. It was a smelly situation, yeah. It was an interesting situation, for sure. God said that he was going to send two of every kind of animal on board the ark. Now, a lot of people sometimes look at that, and I've heard all kinds of people try to say that story can't be true. That's all make-believe. There's no way that every single species on the planet could fit on board that boat. And I say, you know what? You're right. Because God didn't say two of every species, did he? He said two of, a, of each kind. So when we look at what animal kinds tend to be, of course, back in the days when you know, Genesis was being written, we didn't have the modern taxonomical classifications of the kingdom and phyla and genus and species and all these different varieties. But when we look at what a kind of animal typically would be, kind would probably be right around that family level. So we're talking about animals that if you look at like families of animals, we have things like the felines. And so felines are? Kitty cats. Kitty cats. We have canines, which are? Dogs. From, Dogs. from the devil. Yeah. The cats, not the dogs. Like, oh, anybody here a cat fan? Let's see cats. Let's see dogs. Repent. All right, all right. Looks like you won today. Um, so we've got kinds of animals like canines and felines and equines, horses, things like that. Those are kinds, we would say, are families of animals. And those are the kind of animals I believe that we would have on the ark. Not two cheetahs, two bobcats, two tigers, two lions. Not that, but two felines. We know the same thing from dogs. We don't have like two wolves, two Great Danes, two chihuahuas, if you want to consider that a dog. I don't know. Um, but we would have two dogs sorry, or canines. Sorry if you have a chihuahua. Anybody here have a chihuahua? I'm sorry. No, I literally am sorry that you have one. Um, so what we would see are two dogs. And here's the interesting thing. We know from genetics that all dogs on this planet, from the Great Dane down to that chihuahua, come from the same pair of wolf-like ancestors, they say. In other words, a male and a female of a single ancestor group. Now, that makes a lot of sense when we see what Genesis talks about regarding the flood. The same would be true for other kinds, including the dinosaurs. Now, when it comes to dinosaurs, people oftentimes they like to say, well, wait a minute, how can you fit all those dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are huge, massive beasts, don't you know? And I say, yeah, you're right. They were, some, some of them were huge, massive beasts. Also, this ark was quite large, too. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall. We're talking about an ark that's a football field and a half in length. And when it comes to the dinosaurs that we need to fit on board the ark, I do believe they were on there. And so how do you fit all those dinosaurs? That's a big question. Well, first of all, all dinosaurs, no matter how big they ever got, they all started off in an egg about the size of a football, right? Dinosaurs over time grew to be older, and the longer they lived, the older and the bigger they got to be. So interesting thing about reptiles, they never stop growing typically. They continue growing and growing and growing throughout their entire lives. That means things like the big, huge dinosaurs that we see would have been the granddaddy dinosaurs who've been around for a long, long time and would have been surviving and growing and growing and growing. Yet when they were younger and smaller, they were, or younger, they were a lot smaller. And here's the interesting thing, right, Matthew? When, what is the point of all those animals on board the ark? Save them. To save them. And what's the, pur the purpose after the ark? Yeah. To reproduce. You don't need the big, huge, old granddaddy dinosaurs. You need the young, virile ones ready to reproduce. Here's another interesting fun fact. You guys, we know we have some really big dinosaurs, right? Did you know we also have some very, very small dinosaurs? Anybody know the average size of dinosaurs from the big ones down to the small ones? What is the average size of a dinosaur? About the size of a horse. That's on average. Pretty interesting. So we have about horse size on average dinosaurs. And how many different kinds or families of dinosaurs do we have? Well, we've got a lot of different varieties of dinosaurs. We have the ceratopsians, like the triceratops. We have um, the tyrannosaurids, kind of like the sauropods. You see here, we have the sauropods, which are the long neck dinosaurs. We have the hadrosauridae family, all these different types or kinds of dinosaurs, kind of like the dogs, the cats, and things like that. 
of dinosaurs, we only have about 50 to 75 different kinds, you might say, or family groups. So that means, on average, you might say we need 100 to 150 horse-sized animals on board the ark. Now, how much space can that ark hold? Well, let me show you a video right now that might answer some of those questions. Lots of people say there's no way that two of every known species in the world could fit onto Noah's Ark. You know what? We agree. But the truth of the matter is that the Bible doesn't claim that's what happened. So if we really want to get to the truth of it, we're going to need to see what the Bible really says about all this and then ask three questions. How many animals are we really talking about? How big were they? And how big was the Ark? We answer those, we're closer to understanding the truth. Make sense? Good. So how many animals are we really talking about here? Well, let's jump back to move forward, shall we? Let's take a peek at day five of creation week and do a plain reading of Genesis 1 verse 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. Jump ahead to Genesis 125, day six, the same day man and woman were created, and here's what we get. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. So there you have a very clear account of the land and sea creatures created by God according to their kinds. Now, take a look at the phrase, according to their kind. What does it mean? Is it the same as species? I don't think so. It's possible that it's closer to what we call family in the typical biology class today, with some exceptions. Keep in mind that species is a man-made definition anyway. Confused? Huh? Let me explain. Let's take the dog kind, for example. We'll call the female dog taken on the ark Bingo, because that's the name of my first dog. Okay, from Bingo and her mate, you can get the various species of coyote, wolf, and even domestic dogs like the Border Collie, Great Dane, Poodle, and so on. You get it? The different species we have now could have easily been generated after the flood from the information already present within the parent kind. So kind isn't the same as species at all. And a plain reading of the Bible teaches that Noah only had to take the representative of the different kinds of land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. You don't believe me? Take a look for yourself. Genesis 6.20, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. That's as clear as it gets, folks. Simple instructions of what to take and what not to take. And in case we need further understanding of what God meant, he clarifies by telling us what died outside the ark. Genesis 7.22, and in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. Okay, so he's not talking about any sea creatures being on the ark. Not the tiniest seahorse or the largest whale. Uh, because the last time we checked, they weren't swimming around on dry land. He's also not talking about plant life or single-celled organisms or bacteria. No, only things that have the breath of life in its nostrils and are on dry land. That's great, you say. But how many original kinds of land-dwelling, air-breathing creatures are on the ark? Well, to be quite honest, we weren't there, and I don't have the time for each and every detail. But one leading ark researcher did a whole bunch of calculations and was very generous with the numbers he used. He selected the genus level and found that there are less than 8,000 kinds, or about 16,000 individual animals. So let's just round up to say 30,000 and then call it even. It'll make the math easier anyway. Could 30,000 animals fit on the ark described in Genesis? That's a good question. Glad you asked. To answer it, we have to take a look at two more things. The size of the average animal and the size of the ark. Makes sense? Of course it does. Moving on. We can't list every animal, but we've got things from the various bird kinds to the elephant Elephant. kind, from the various dinosaur kinds to the smallest mammal kinds, and so on and so on and so on. So, you take all the young adult animals, because nothing says the animals had to be the oldest and biggest, and you look at all the various sizes we know of today, even from the fossil record, and you do some calculating, you come to the conclusion that the average size of the land animal is actually smaller than a sheep. But let's just use a sheep as the average size for the sake of argument. So now we've got the size of the average animal, a sheep, and we have the maximum number of sheep, 30,000. So are we going to need a bigger boat? Well, let's see how big it really was and if 30,000 sheep could fit on it. Back to the Bible. Genesis 6.15. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Genesis 6.16. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Using what's known as a small cubit, that makes the ark approximately 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and about 45 feet high, with three decks, a door, and a window. So this ain't no canoe or a bathtub boat with giraffe heads poking out of it. This is a huge, seaworthy vessel. The total available floor space on the ark would have been over 100,000 square feet. The total cubic volume would have been 1,500,000 and 18,000 cubic feet, which is about the capacity of 522 railroad stock cars. So we're getting down to the nitty gritty here, folks. How many sheep can fit into 522 stock cars? Well, just so happens I know the answer. The average double deck railroad stock car can fit about 240 sheep. Now that's a lot of wool. So 522 stock cars holding 240 sheep sized animals each gives us the hefty total of 125,280 sheep sized creatures that could have fit onto the ark. Remember, we only needed to fit 30,000 on it, and 30,000 is almost two times the already generous estimate of animals necessary to represent all the species we see today.
So it's easy to see that with more realistic numbers there was plenty of room for cages, food, and even fresh water for the duration of the year-long stay that these animals had to be on the ark. And you know what? Ark researchers have studied this too, and I'll let you look that up. So there you have it. Simple reading of scripture, simple math, basic science. This fallible claim against the Bible is debunked. Adios. <laughs> I'm going to date myself. I'm going to date myself. You guys remember the Micro Machine Man? Yeah. I think that's that guy. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, it's come from our friends uh, over at Reasons for Hope, fantastic organization that we've worked with for a number of years. Um, fast paced, but I love it. So that helps understand, it gives an understanding of the size of the ark, and those calculations they're talking about also include the dinosaur kind. So yeah, I absolutely believe we did have dinosaurs. The question is, do we find dinosaurs in the Bible? You know, where is that found? Well, the word dinosaur is not found in the Bible because the word dinosaur was not even invented until 1871 by a guy named Sir Richard Owen, who was the first director of the Natural History Museum in London. And uh, pretty exciting stuff. If you ever get a chance to go over there, really neat things about early history and paleontology. But this word dinosaur, we're not going to find in the Bible because it didn't come about. But is there a description of an animal that I believe matches a dinosaur? I think so. And we look here in Job chapter 40, verse 15. It says, Behold, or said, look at behemoth which I made along with you, and which eats grass like an ox, what strength it has in its loins, what power um, in the muscles of its belly, its tail swings like a cedar, the sinews of its thighs are close-knit, its bones are like tubes of bronze, its limbs like rods of iron, and it ranks first among the works of God. So looking at this animal, the description that you would see about this animal, I think the only animal that fits every one of these criteria is actually a sauropod-like dinosaur, Kind of like you see in the picture here, in the kind of brontosaurus, apatosaurus, brachiosaur family. A big, huge, lumbering beast. I mean, I love verse 17. His tail swings like a cedar. Here we are in Cedar City, a great place to be, right? What is a cedar, you guys? It's a tree. Now, the Bible describes oftentimes those cedars being like the cedars of Lebanon. That's where they were really famous and growing. Those are not like little short, little stubby cedars or juniper trees like we have around here. No, we're talking about big, massive, tall trees. And so its tail swings like a tree. Now, interestingly, we kind of talked about it last night, but when you look at your Bible, sometimes you might find a description or like a little like footnote, I mean. You look at the footnote at the bottom there, and it could say something like this, you know, could mean, you know, unknown animal could mean an elephant or a hippopotamus. Well, I'll remind you guys, those footnotes are not part of the inspired word of God. They are somebody's opinion. And I will tell you right now, whoever wrote that footnote, I don't believe was reading the description that God gives. Because this animal, this creature, behemoth, is in a list of well-known animals. This is not some fantasy, make-believe, mythological creature that God is describing. No, God is using different animals and describing their characteristics and their attributes to give to Job and show basically Job, hey, do you think this animal swift of flight and running and all the power, if you think all these different animals are amazing, well, what about the one who made them? God goes on to describe behemoth, another real-life animal that Job would have seen. We know that because right here it says, look at behemoth, which I made alongside with you. In other words, hey, Job, take a look and see behemoth, and I made alongside with you. In other words, living at the same time. And it goes on to describe it being a vegetarian, you might say, and the strength and the power in the tail. You ever see the tail of an elephant? Does it look like a giant tree? No. A little twig, a little pinky thing. How about a hippopotamus? Anybody have seen a hippo tail? You might not even think about it because they barely even have a tail, right? But this is not the animal that God is describing. The only animal that actually matches every one of these things, including the last verse here, it ranks first or chief among the works of God. In other words, the biggest animal God's ever created. The largest land animal ever to exist that we have evidence for is a sauropod-like dinosaur like the Argentinosaurus, a big, huge, massive dinosaur. This is the chiefest, the greatest, the biggest of God's creation. And I believe, personally, behemoth is actually a description of a dinosaur that would have got off the ark and would have been around for some time, and Job would have been a witness to this. Now, why don't we have dinosaurs today running around everywhere? Well, some good reasons, first of all. Some of these dinosaurs are not exactly friendly, we would think. So if you're coming off and you know trying to establish your family and a big old dinosaur is coming your way, what are you going to do? You can protect your family and kill that dinosaur. If you're trying to feed your family and you see this dinosaur coming your way, here's a brontosaurus burger like the Flintstones, right? There's a good food source. So I think over time, man hunted dinosaurs, killed them off, picked them off. But also, after the flood in Noah's day, the world was very different. 
conditions of the world had changed since the pre-flood world to today. And so I think a lot of the food sources that they ate were just not around. The world was devastated by the flood. It took a long time for things to kind of rebound and regrow, we think. And we don't think that the world ever really came back to the beautiful, very good conditions, maybe garden-like conditions in the pre-flood world. So I think that limited the ability for dinosaurs to reproduce and to thrive. And just because dinosaurs may have come off the ark doesn't mean that they had to live to the present day, right? We have a lot of animals, like the dodo, who's gone extinct. You know, a lot of, a lot of other creatures, a lot of other animals have gone extinct from the ark until today. So that's a very quick answer, hopefully, to that question of dinosaurs. Uh, we could do a whole hour and a half talk on just dinosaurs, which is fun and exciting. I love it. Um, I've been able to do a lot of like you know, digs for different paleontology and fossils, and I've got a bunch of fossils at uh, my home and even some dinosaur eggshells and cool things. I should have brought show and tell today, right? Yeah. That would have been fun. Next time. Next time. <laughs> All right. All right, um, next question. Next question. Now, I don't know, uh, I know someone in this church asked this question. I don't know if they're talking about their husband or not, but how do cavemen align with the Bible, and did they exist millions of years before Adam and Eve? So where do cavemen fit in? Well, that is a great question that's been asked. You know, people ask that all the time. Um, cavemen are just men that live in caves. caves. So we have an understanding of cavemen sometimes because of the, the evidence we find. We find some of their remains, some of their bones. We also find tools and instruments. They find actual musical instruments, things like flutes that they made. We find that cavemen, supposedly, you know, supposed cavemen, also performed burials and did things just like normal people would do. What is an explanation for cavemen? Well, I think a lot of people coming off the ark as they're traveling around the world, the most easy place to live for some time is going to be a cave. It's a place of protection. And then we kind of get this, in, this understanding and it's really ingrained in the evolutionary theory of long ages and dumb brutes dragging their knuckles. Well, dumb brutes don't make you know, musical instruments. Dumb brutes don't make tools. But if you're traveling from an ark and then you're going to places like Babel and then you're dispersing from there and you're traveling from place to place to place, the most common place, you know, imagine if you look at this next picture here, you can see, you know, imagine you're traveling around with your family and you're going to try to find a place to live and you don't have very, very good resources so you're hunting and gathering where you can and you're building things out of stone tools because you don't really have the technology or ability to move beyond that into you know, the Copper Age, the, the Bronze Age, and the, the Iron Age yet. Well, naturally, if you were stumbling along here, you might come across a beautiful cave and you would live in that cave and guess what you would be? A caveman. Just because people live in caves does not somehow make them dumb roots. You know, it doesn't mean that they are somehow less evolved than even we might be. It's simply one of the best places to live. In fact, we see in the Bible here, Lot, you can see up here in this verse, Lot actually, interestingly, lived in a cave. Now Lot went up out of, out of Zor and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zor. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. Do you know the Bible talks about cavemen? Yeah, here you go. So naturally, I would say one of the best explanations, I think, is that people, when they're traveling around, they're going to go to places that's going to be safe and a place of refuge. Now, a cave is a natural home, a natural environment. And because people were able to be in caves, it actually helped preserve and protect their remains and um, those tools and things that we find within those caves, unlike people who may have been living outside of those caves who just aren't found, really, because things fall apart, decay, and decompose. So I think one of the best explanations for caves is what would you expect to find with a people group who are entering into a devastated world who are trying to look for resources or hunting and gathering where they can, it's going to take a while for civilization to rebound and to come together properly after the flood of Noah's day. It's one of my things I like to see. All right. All right. We can get to the next question, I think. Yeah, next question. All right, so this is in regards to the flood. So where do our various ethnic people groups, um, commonly known as races, mm -hmm. uh, come from, and how was the world repopulated after the flood? And how does that line up with archaeology? These are a couple of great, fantastic questions. I love it. Um, so we hear that term races oftentimes used, and it's oftentimes thrown out there, different races. The Bible does not teach about different races. In fact, genetics does not teach about different races. We are all one race. We are the human race. Now, we have different varieties. We have different you know, ethnicities. We have different you know, different variations, even with humans. You know, we have people that have light skin, dark skin. People have short or curly hair, uh, straight hair. We have people of all different shapes, sizes, and, and all sorts of variety. That doesn't mean that there are different races. 
And that idea of race is oftentimes is, is so ingrained in the evolutionary thinking that things like Charles Darwin, you know, his idea of races actually was that certain so-called races were more highly evolved than other races, which means if you're not this ideal race, then you're less evolved, you're more of the kind of the dumb group spectrum. Now that whole idea, whole idea was really commonly seen in his book, The Evolution, or The uh, Descent of Man, and the preservation of favored races. Now what does that sound like, the favored races? So in other words, if you're not part of the favored race, you're not favorable. That idea of, of evolution has been used and utilized to bring about some really tremendously terrible things like, you know, there was this big war that happened back in the 40s, right? And there was a whole people group that were deciding that some people were better than other people and let's exterminate the other people. A lot of that ideology was actually founded with this idea of favored races. So this is a concept of racism that is still prevalent today and it does not come from the Bible. It comes from this idea that certain races of people or people groups are more highly advanced and evolved than others. I think that's a terrible, terrible mistake. What we see as people are we all come from the same parents, Adam and Eve, right? Interestingly, we not only know this from, um, from what we see in the, in the Bible, we see this in genetics. When you look at things like mitochondrial DNA, all seven to eight billion of us on this planet, guess what? We all share the same mitochondrial DNA markers that show we come from the same one single woman. In fact, those guys who do all those studies and put all together the molecular genetics and all that stuff, they call her mitochondrial Eve. Okay, very fitting. Now also interestingly, all males on this planet, we look at our, the Y chromosome, which is passed on from father to son, father to son. Interestingly, if you follow the Y chromosome back like through the family trees, there's a, actually a genetic bottleneck with the Y chromosome that identifies three different males. We all come from one of three different males. Now who would those three males be? Am, Shem, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah that came off the ark. So interestingly, science actually confirms scripture when we look at it that way. Now, when we look at the people groups, now where do we get the variety of people groups? That is a fantastic question. Of course, after the flood, we get to places like the Tower of Babel, like you'll see here. And so the Tower of Babel, people are gathering together. Some of the people are gathering together to build a great tower and a name unto themselves. What does God say for them to do when they got off the ark? He says, be fruitful and multiply, you know, fill the earth and, you know, go spread out. And what do people do? They defy that. In direct defiance to what God has said, they said, let's not be dispersed. Let's build a tower and a name unto ourselves so that we should not be scattered among the whole earth. Well, God sees what they're doing, that direct disobedience, sees what's going on, and he confuses those languages so that now people are no, no longer able to communicate. Because, Matthew, if I were asking you for a hammer and I heard you heard some completely different language, you would have no idea what I'm saying, right? Yeah. It would be really hard for us to work together if we didn't speak the same language. But all of a sudden, if I heard somebody over here, if I heard Dan over here, and I'll, oh, Dan, you can understand me, right? I can understand you. Okay, fantastic. Come over here, come over here. Let's get away from these weirdos, you know? What you're going to happen is you're going to gather together with people you can understand, and those people groups are going to travel. They're going to go to different places throughout the world. Now, as people travel and migrate, we have what we call kind of genetic isolation. So as people groups and families continue to have children and stay in the same region, different characteristics and traits are passed on from fathers and sons and mothers to daughters, you know, or passed on from parents to children. We're going to get to see different genetic traits arise. Now, some places we actually do believe in things like um, natural selection. We do believe in things like speciation and variety. We do believe some of those are driven by environmental pressures, you might say. So for example, if you have, let's talk about dogs again, since you like dogs so much, Matthew. I'm more of a cat person, but it's okay. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get along in heaven. Um, so if you have two different dogs, and let's say you have one dog that has really, really long hair, and one dog that has really, really short hair. And if you put those two dogs in Antarctica, which of those two dogs is going to thrive and survive? The long hair. Now, if that dog meets another dog with long hair and they have children, guess what? Those puppies are going to have long hair, long fur. That poor little dog that has no fur, no hair, really, is going to freeze to death. The chihuahua. The chihuahua, exactly. Thank the Lord. So the chihuahua is going to freeze to death. It's no longer going to be able to pass on its genes, its characteristic genetic traits for short hair, short fur. So over a short amount of time, pretty soon, all dogs in that area are going to have long fur. Now, the opposite would be true if you take them down to southern Mexico. You know, if you're down there where it's hot, those dogs with all the heat and the long fur, they're going to cook to death. That's why you have chihuahuas down there, right? Now, what we see very soon is that 
speciation, variety, selected for things like that, actually produce populations of short-haired dogs, long-haired dog, dogs. Similar things happen with humans. As people travel and migrate, interestingly enough, if you're down near the equator, we find a lot more dark skin around the equator zones where there's a lot more sunlight. Now, for someone who's very light-skinned, that sun can do a lot of damage, including things like skin cancers and diseases and things like that. Dark skin is actually a production of melanin. That production of melanin, that increase in melanin, actually protects people from damaging effects from the sun. Now, if I were to go down to, you know, somewhere down around the equator, and I were to live there for some time, and that sun would be baking my skin, and I would be sunburned, and I'd have blisters and boils and cancers and all kinds of stuff, and if I'm looking for a wife, and yet next to me someone with darker skin who is not damaged by that sun and looks very, very nice, which, uh, which of the two of us is that my wife or that woman gonna fight, try to choose? That woman's not gonna look at me because uh, I'm not looking so healthy, right? Someone with darker skin. And so over time, we see genetic populations develop for things like darker skin or different um, you know, eye shapes and things like that. Uh, we have a lot of Eskimo Inuits who have very like narrow eyes. And one of the reasons they believe that is because snow blindness actually affects a lot of people. And so if you have less sunlight hitting your eyes, you actually have less damage to your retina. And so it's over time, we do see some change in variety within even people groups. Now, that doesn't mean evolution from different animals to humans or things like that. It simply means that God has created variety. And within Adam and Eve, and also passed on through Noah, we have the variety and the genetics to be able to create incredible populations with variety and diversity. And so coming off of the Tower of Babel, if you look at this next slide here, you can see people will travel and migrate throughout the world. So as they're traveling and migrating, people are going to different regions around the world over time due to either the natural pressure, pressures of the environment or due to some kind of genetic drift, we have different varieties, different, um, you know, different characteristics, you might say, within people groups. But if you look at the next slide, you can see you know, the genetics really shows us who we are and we are all the same people group, all the same one blood. And I've got another fantastic video right now that will help explain this exact topic. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 1726, where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1, through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children, and those children had children, and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark, and according to Genesis 9:19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11, and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together, they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, and thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. 
Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. You guys didn't know you were going to be coming to a science talk today very much when coming to church. Um, yeah, awesome. So yeah, we are all different shades of brown, actually. That's what we factually know. And it's interesting, though, that skin color is the one thing that people oftentimes look to for race and for variety and differences and segregation and things like that, right? I mean, we have so much other variety within people groups. You know, we have light hair, we have dark hair, we have all sorts of different, you know, characteristics. But we always focus on the skin shade thing, and that really is an unfair thing for a lot of people groups, and it really is not even something that we should find biblically. We are all the same, you know, same one blood, one race, the same people, descended from Adam and Eve, descended through Noah's family, and so all of us, you know, seven to eight billion of us on this planet are one blood, one race. And so that really is, in a very short explanation, I think an answer, biblical answer to racism, you know. And we should come away from even using this term race. And really, it's, there are varieties. There are different people groups. And it's an incredible thing that we see, actually, that God loves variety. And so that's one of the things that we love to see. And so interestingly, um, this next slide right here kind of shows you just really the heart of everything that we see with God throughout the creation. We talked a little bit about dinosaurs and then, you know, drowning in the flood. We talked about the flood and the ark. We talked about the Tower of Babel. And what you're seeing is time and time again, people are messing up, Right. I mean, God has a perfect plan. He creates things very good. He creates a plan. We mess it up, don't we? But the beauty of that is that no matter how much we continue to mess up, whether it's back in you know, Adam and Eve's day, back into the days of Noah when the world was wicked and violent, the Tower of Babel, the times where they're constantly wandering through the wilderness and they're rebelling against God and back and forth, the kings of, of Israel and Judah back and forth. When we constantly we read that in the Bible and say, well, how could these people have constantly fallen away from God? And man, look at them. How could they be doing this? And we oftentimes read that, but we don't always read into our own lives and say, well, how many times do we ourselves sometimes, you know, mess up and continue doing things? And today we have the, the revelation of Jesus Christ and we have so much more of a complete Bible. We have so much more revelation of who God is. And yet we're perfect, aren't we? Right? We, do, we don't make mistakes. No, of course we do. We still continue to fall away. But here's the neat thing. And I love this picture because... Not only did God create us in his image and breathe life into mankind, but he continues to reach down to us when we make mistakes, when we turn away from him. He reaches down to us and throughout history, and that's why I love reading the Bible. I love studying books like Genesis and Exodus because I love those deep histories because what I see, the character and nature of God in those accounts, is the same God today that reaches down to us and we can have confidence and realize that Christ is constantly working in our lives to better us, and God is continually reaching into who we are to call us back to ourselves and to pull us up and to redeem us and to rescue us from even our own miry self and our own the mistakes and our own lives and the mistakes that we have. So I think it's encouraging when we read these things, and I'm really excited because the questions you guys have tell me you guys have been thinking deeply about them. So um, anything else? We, maybe some other questions that we had that you want to get to? I'm going to get to just one more question, if that's okay, okay. with everybody. And I can okay. hang out afterwards, you guys. Plenty of time, yeah. and we can Q&A. All of this is from a perspective of a biblical worldview. Yeah. Okay. And so the question then is, and I think probably how we should have started all of this, uh, now that I think about it, <laughs> is how can we trust the Bible? That is a fantastic question that people ask all the time. How can we trust the Bible? You know, I think there's a lot of different things that we can see 
um, things like prophecies that have been fulfilled, you know, things that were spoken about in the Bible that that's one great way we can talk about. But my, my personal, one of my favorite things, because my background is actually in archaeology, okay? So my master's work is in archaeology and ancient civilizations in the ancient Near East. And so what I love in studying archaeology and history is so many things that the Bible talks about, events and activities and things that we actually find in archaeology. I personally know archaeologists who are not Christian believers, who don't believe in all the supernatural things of the Bible, but yet use the Bible as an archaeological handbook because they basically say, everything that I read in here, I find down here. You know, and I'm digging in the dirt. What it says here is there. So they actually use that from a, just a historical perspective. And so to me, it's amazing to see that the things that the Bible talks about, like the, the fall of Jericho, we can see evidence for that exact same thing. We can see the, the collapsed walls of Jericho. We can go and investigate, and then we can actually see that there are grain jars still containing grain, which is not typically what would happen if you were to go as a normal army ransacking a place. You're going to take all the riches. Well, there are things that were left behind that would not normally be left behind. But, of course, God in the Bible says don't take anything from there, right? Leave everything intact. And so they leave, but, you know, one guy, Achan, takes something, and he ends up, you know, paying for it with his life. But God commands them not to take anything. And so this is completely unlike any other you know, army that would go through there. We have direct evidence in Egypt for the Hebrew Israelites living there in the biblical land of Goshen. I've been over there a number of times, just returned in November, where I was there. That's part of my master's thesis, is actually working on the Egyptian side of the Hebrew Israelites living there in that time. And there's tremendous evidence in archaeology and history. So from an archaeological standpoint, if you're just looking at like facts and evidence, I think what you're seeing in scripture is what we're finding in the sand. And so we do find a lot of that evidence. And so we also see things, again, like those prophecies. We can see things unfolding in events. And so to me, those are some of the great, if you're talking about like physical, actual evidence of tangible things, that's great. But in many other ways, I mean, we read those accounts and God, I believe, you know, God speaks to our hearts. And when we read these things, things come alive and God speaks to us in many different ways. God is a living God. And so there are things that I believe that God speaks to us individually. If we seek him, we can listen to that still, small voice, and God reveals himself to us. And many times that's a personal thing between, you know, God and, and us. But in so many ways, you know, from our perspective of Scripture, everything I see in Scripture, I find in science. And when you look at science from a proper biblical perspective, I think it really does come alive. We start with Scripture, and it gives us an understanding of science. We start with God's Word, and it gives us an understanding of God's world. And so from science, and like last night we talked about uh, space and astronomy, we talked about geology, all these areas of science I believe really do show that God's word is true. And so we could talk a whole long time about a lot of different topics, but those are a couple of answers that I, I would personally give. Of course, I love the archaeology, so that's my favorite one to go to there, right. Matthew. Yeah. All right, Nate, thank you so much, man. Very we welcome. We're so grateful that you came and uh, shared your time with us. Before you uh, hop off, I want to pray for you, Dan. If you want to come over here, I just want to pray yeah. and have you guys pray uh, for Nate. As I mentioned, Nate has a ministry down in Grand Canyon, uh, as he talked about, uh, and, and he's ultimately pointing people back to God, Yeah, pointing them back to the true and the living God of the Bible that we believe is our firm foundation that drives our worldview and ultimately to the need that we are all sinners and we all are in need of someone to save us and his name is jesus christ who came i love the story of the tower of babel it was man's attempt to reach god and the gospel is the opposite Mm. it was god descending down to the depravity of humankind and making a way for us to reach him so that we didn't have to create another tower of babel and so nate we're just going to pray a prayer blessing over you and your ministry and i just want to invite everybody here uh, as we get ready also just to, to have a moment of prayer and response in just a moment. So, 